Hello, and welcome to episode 127 of Public Interest Podcast with your host, Jordan Cooper, where we interview politicians, activists, advocates, and others who seek to improve the state of the world. We're here today with Kathy Slega, delegate from District 7 in Baltimore and Hartford counties, minority whip in the Maryland General Assembly, Republican nominee for United States Senate in 2016, member of the Health and Government Operations Committee, a small business owner, and a former congressional staffer for Congressman Andy Harris. Kathy, how are you doing today? I'm great. How are you doing? I'm wonderful. So glad to have you with us. The first question I'd like to ask you is, what are you currently doing or what have you ever done to advance the public interest and why? Oh, my, that's such a broad question, Jordan, and what a great opportunity I have to address that. And as a public official, I think every day I get up and I think, how can I make the people in Maryland's lives better? One of the biggest joys that I have as a state delegate is being able to help solve problems for the people who live in my district and even those across the state. Oftentimes, I find what happens is people get very discouraged and frustrated with government and trying to negotiate the layers and layers of bureaucracy that have been created. So oftentimes, I um, really find a lot of um, satisfaction in being able to come in and cut through red tape for people. So that is one of the most effective things I think that most people in my office are able to do to help everyday citizens like you and me. I'm sure many listeners, Kathy, can uh, sympathize with uh, the frustration they may have felt in navigating government bureaucracy. Can you provide a concrete example to help crystallize the idea of what exactly it is that you've been able to do for your constituents um, by providing an example of when someone came to you with a problem and how you were able to help them navigate bureaucracy to get them a solution to that problem? Uh, Sure. I guess I'll I'll go back to uh, five or six years ago when I was first elected to the House of Delegates, and I attended the Waterman's Caucus. That is a group of commercial watermen from across our state that come to Annapolis, uh, usually on Monday nights, and let us know uh, the challenges and successes that they have and make sure that they're represented in, in our legislature. You know, it's such a great historic part of our state, a waterman and, and the Chesapeake Bay. And they had talked about a problem getting oyster tags, which, you know, to most of us who are not watermen, you know, what's an oyster tag? Well, every bushel of oysters that is harvested has to have a tag on it so that we know where that came from. And mm-hmm. we had a great uh, harvest of oysters that year. And mm-hmm. the Department of Natural Resources is the department that issues these oyster tags. Well, they ran out of them. And so this hard, this created quite a hardship for our watermen, um, many of whom are, you know, work long days. They would have to leave the job early. You know, you can imagine if you lived on Tangier Island uh, to go to the mainland, get in a vehicle, drive to Salisbury, get to the DNR office before it closed at 4 o'clock, mm-hmm. you know, to stand in line and see if you could get these oyster tags which they would, uh, you know, time and time again say, no, we don't, we're out of them. So I put a bill in to address this problem, and, and, um, you know, often we can fix problems without a law, which is great because, you know, Jordan, I I never meet people who say, Kathy, the problem in in Annapolis is we just don't have enough laws. You know, that that has never been a complaint I've had. (laughs) So, um, you know, we, we put a bill in to bring, att- mm-hmm. uh, to bring attention to this situation. Well, guess what happened? what happened? DNR modernized their system and allowed the watermen to print these oyster tags from their home. There you go. Isn't that great? And so, these are the kind of things that, you know, I love being able to address, helping, um, you know, cut through red tape and create efficiencies for citizens and small business owners alike to, um, you know, just be able to do what they do best and not have government intrusion into their lives. And just for clarification, was the purpose of those oyster tags to ensure that only a certain amount of oysters were fished so as not to deplete the oyster population in the bay? There are multiple reasons for oyster tags. One one is to make sure that the, the watermen are adhering to their quotas. But mm-hmm. another reason is for safety. 
Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if there was a, an outbreak of salmonella or some problem with oysters, because as you know, people eat ro- raw oysters, that right. we, okay. they'd be able to track it back to, you know, a potential reef or a place where there might be a problem with the oysters. And, um, you know, so so that that's been, uh, you know, was another part of the reason that they need oyster tags. So there were public health and environmental concerns And the problem that they had was more of a logistical problem, which was was just very difficult to get from where they were over to the uh, state office of environmental and natural resources, Department of Natural Resources. And so you were able to allow them to do it, to print these tags from home and save them the whole, the whole fuss of getting back and forth. That really is a great story of expediting government without actually introducing any new pieces of legislation. That said, you do introduce pieces of legislation as a uh, member of the House of Delegates. Can you talk a little bit about what kind of priorities you're bringing, especially um, I know that you emphasize being a small business owner. You are on the Health and Government Operations Committee. Does, can you speak a little bit maybe about how, I'm not sure if it's health insurance to your, to your employees, but can you speak a little bit about how being a small business owner has informed your legislative agenda in the Maryland House of Delegates and what kind of pieces of legislation you've introduced in the last six or seven years? Thanks, Jordan. Yeah, that's another great question. Um, One of the wonderful values of being a citizen legislator and having a part-time legislature is that we, all 188 of us, are supposed to bring with us their 47 senators and 141 delegates. And we're all supposed to come to Annapolis for our 90-day session, which begins the second Wednesday in January and goes 90 consecutive days, which is usually the second Monday in April um, is when we adjourn. Um, We're supposed to bring with us the information and talents and expertise from our private life. And, gosh, it would be so much better if Washington, D.C. worked the same way, you know, if they were a part-time body that went back and lived in the community and worked in the community and worked in a profession that allowed them to bring real-life experience to the table. Mm-hmm. So I'll, I'll tell you a, a story about um, how, how this, the rubber hits the road on these kind of things. Um, I am a small business owner. Uh, Thirty Over 30 years ago, my husband and I started a small general contracting business, and we do commercial and residential um, uh, contracting. We also do have some rental properties, and, you know, as many small businesses, you know, do, do whatever we can to pay the bills. And um, so we had an issue on unemployment insurance. And uh, this revolved around whether someone should be called an independent contractor or not. And we Mm -hmm. had had this argument in the past when it came to landscapers and snow removal and flooring contractors. So, you know, maybe, uh, you know, four years ago, we had had this issue in the legislature and and really dealt with it quite uh, in depth. Unfortunately, you know, when there's a party line vote, Um, people aren't forced to really understand the intricacies of this issue, and and that is what had happened on that issue. So last year, or the year before last, we had the same issue come back in regards to nail technicians. So that would be for those of us ladies that like to get our our fingernails, uh, our toenails Mm -hmm. done, and men too, you know, nothing better than a pedicure, Um, to the the, the, uh, ladies, mostly uh, women, but there's obviously men that work in men's salons as well. Um, Are they independent contractors or are they employees of the business? And so two different uh, Democrat friends of mine came to see me to separate conversations, and they said, Kathy, I, I know you've made a payroll, so let's talk about this bill in detail. Um, you know, tell me your thoughts. And I said, well, let me ask you one question. Who pays your unemployment insurance? And both of these gentlemen thought about it, and they said, you know what? I pay my unemployment insurance. And I said, well, you know what? I don't think you've read your pay stub lately because you don't and you never have paid your unemployment insurance. That is an insurance that the employer pays. Right, exactly. So, 
you know, I, I felt good about being able to bring some insight to the conversation with these individual legislators, which I mm-hmm. think affected the outcome of that vote. So I think that highlights why it's important to have people. Now, we have, you know, small business owners. We have teachers. We have, um, you know, a, a salesmen. And, and we used to have some um, people that worked in salon, beauty salons. I don't think we have anybody right now. But we have lawyers and um, doctors and people. Uh, the best government is where you have representatives that represents all walks of life because then you get a much, much better product um, as far as laws go. Sure. And just for our listeners who are curious, what was the outcome of that bill? Were nail salon technicians classified subsequently as employees in nail salon and therefore eligible for certain benefits that are extended to employees? Well, in the end, I think they, they decided that um, it wasn't as cut and dry as they thought and that hmm. – um, some are employees and some are independent contractors. And, Jordan, just so your listeners know, if mm-hmm. you're an independent contractor, you're eligible to get unemployment insurance if you pay the premium. So mm-hmm. anyone who owns a business is welcome to call the state of Maryland who administers unemployment insurance and mm-hmm. sign up and send in your, um, you know, just like your car insurance. Your you premium. Know, your, yeah, you pay you pay a premium, you pay into the insurance product, and then if you need to um, make a claim on that, you you can then um, make a claim. And if you do not, if you um, you know are an, a sole proprietor, you don't have to have unemployment insurance. But then of course you cannot get the benefit. So it, it's open to anyone in Maryland who wants to have unemployment insurance. If you're a business. Um, you know, the state of Maryland is happy to administer that for you. So it sounds like you've been getting a lot of work done in the Maryland General Assembly, both in terms of constituent services and in terms of actually working on real legislation uh, in the state legislature. This last year, um, you decided to embark upon a campaign to represent the entire state of Maryland, all six million Marylanders in the United States Senate. Can you speak a little bit more about what led you to make that decision and what that experience was like? Oh, yes. It was a, a um, decision that, that I took very seriously and thoughts and prayers with my family, of course, and my husband. I've been married for, I guess, gosh, 37 years now. We have two grown sons. They're both married and a, a one grandchild and another on the way. And so, uh, you know, running a statewide campaign is a nonstop, seven-day-a-week, uh, you know, virtually 24-hour-a-day <laughs> endeavor. And um, so we, you know, my family got behind me, and they said, Kathy, yes, you should do this, that the people of Maryland deserve to have a choice. And we knew at that point it was uh, Donna Edwards or Chris Van Hollen would um, be the Democrat nominee and, um, you know, there were, I think, 14 people in my primary for mm-hmm. the Republican uh, primary race. In the end, it, it ended up, as you, as everyone knows, Chris Van Hollen was the Democrat nominee, and ultimately he was, um, he is currently our U.S. Senator. So um, it was a great experience. It was a lot of work, and uh, traveled across our great state, um, met so many wonderful people, um, business owners and people on the shore and the lower shore, the crab picking house and in the middle shore, a, um, you know, a steel uh, fabricator in College Park and a great, uh, we have so many amazing people and businesses across our great state. It was a wonderful experience in that regard. It was a lot of work. And um, while we were not successful, we thought it was very important that voters have a choice. We uh, received almost a million votes, uh, about 975,000 votes. We won 18 of Maryland's 24 counties. And I think for the first time in modern history, as far as we could find, um, the U.S. Senate candidate outperformed the presidential candidate, which generally does not happen. Um, You know, just very proud to represent women across our state and you know, I left agreeing with Donna Edwards in the fact that it's really a shame that there are no women for the first time in 40 years 
representing us in Washington, D.C. The entire Maryland delegation is all men. So it sounds like you have a lot to be proud of. You invested a lot of resources, time and energy, not only your own time, energy, and resources, but that of, of your family and your friends, your supporters, and all your campaign contributors when you ran that campaign. You did mention that ultimately you were unsuccessful in uh, winning the seat for the U.S. Senate, but you were successful in getting more votes than uh, the Republican nominee for president and getting uh, so winning 18 of 24 counties in the state of Maryland. Knowing what you know now, that ultimately you did lose the campaign, would you would you go back? Would you still have run for that seat if you had known that you weren't going to win? You still provided Marylanders with a choice, but knowing that you weren't ultimately going to be successful, would you have still run the campaign? Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> and um, Jordan, you know, it, it, anyone who's been involved in a campaign um, at you know the day-to-day level understands how arduous and difficult and uh, time-consuming and frankly exhausting it is. And, uh, you know, in, in October, I right before the election, which was, as you know, uh, early November, I said to my team, I have a whole new appreciation of Jonah. <laughs> so you're, you know, you and your listeners probably know the story of Jonah and the whale. And, and God said to Jonah, Jonah, you're going to go to Nineveh and, you know, preach, preach to those sinners. And, and Jonah said, I am not. He got on a boat and he went the other direction. And, and I said, I, I have a heart. I understand Jonah. I, I think in October I was feeling the same way that, um, you know, I'm not sure the bang was worth the buck right now. But then after the election, you know, had a little bit of time to decompress and, and, you know, get my life back to normal, so to speak, and not that life is ever normal, um, I'm very happy that I did it. It was a lot of hard work, and um, but, you know, I, I wanted I, – we achieved our goal that we gave voters a choice in the state, and that mm-hmm. no one should be coronated. And while this is a Democrat state and presidential elections are difficult for – the minority party to um, win in, in a presidential year, it doesn't mean that you still don't give voters a choice and voters a voice across our state. And very proud of the effort that we mounted that, um, you know, just giving a cogent, articulate, and common sense voice to the minority party in Maryland is is always so important. Now, you did retain your seat in the House of Delegates representing District 7 throughout the course of the campaign. Uh, Similarly, perhaps, um, to how Paul Ryan um, was able to remain in the U.S. House of Representatives after having been a vice president. Of course, that led to him eventually rising in leadership to chair a committee and becoming Speaker of the House. Have, you've already you're already in Republican leadership in the House of Delegates, but would you say that there's any difference in the way you approach your job or the way that your colleagues in the Maryland House of Delegates approach you after you have been the Republican nominee for U.S. Senate in the 2016 race? Well, I, you know, I was really humbled and honored to receive the support of so many people across the state, so many of my fellow delegates and senators from Annapolis, and of course to be endorsed and supported by Governor Larry Hogan. Very proud of that. But I will also tell you that so many of my Democrat friends in Annapolis have um, come up to me and, and, and personally congratulated me and said, Kathy, you ran a great race. You should be very proud of the effort that you mounted. You were, uh, you know, a woman of integrity and honesty, and, and you handled yourself um, with class, and that just meant so much to me. So, you know, I think that uh, one of our goals was to raise the um, profile of the Maryland Republican Party and and let people know that, you know, this is what we look like. We look like middle-aged blonde ladies with, uh, you know, small businesses and grandkids, and our ideas are important and they deserve a a seat at the table. So, you know, very proud of that. And I learned so much personally. Look, I got to know you, Jordan, right? (laughs) That's right. (laughs) So, you know, I've, I've met so many great people across the state and opened a lot of doors. Um, you know, and so I, I feel a, a great sense of importance in representing women across the state and, you know, having carried that banner for them 
and, you know, looking at my granddaughter, making sure that our, my daughter-in-laws and my granddaughter have women to look, look at and say, you know what, it is worth taking a risk. And you don't always win, but you get out there and you fight hard and you, you know, you, you handle yourself with integrity. And, and so that was an, an important part of the race for me as well. So as we approach the end of the podcast, I'd like to ask you a final question, which is to speak to our listeners about how you plan to build upon your record of public service, how you plan to continue serving in the House of Delegates, um, what you hope at the end of the day, at the end of your career, you will have accomplished as a public servant um, to advance the public interest with the perspective you bring from the private sector. And if you can just take a moment and talk about not only that legacy that you will be creating through your years of public service and your effort on the campaign trail and in the legislature, but also your motivations. Uh, again, there may be some people listening who aren't sure exactly, they may have a sense that they want to advance the public interest, but aren't sure exactly how to do it. So maybe taking a moment to address your own thought processes and doubts and how you're able to overcome those to uh, really try to work through your career to advance the public interest. Oh, thanks, Jordan. That's that's a great question again. And, um, you know, I reflect back as, um, you know, encouraging women especially to take a chance, to get out there and run for office and work hard and handle yourself with integrity and know that even after you've run a, either a political campaign or if you're working hard for a, a political cause that you believe in, to remember at the end of the day, you still have to be yourself. And never to conduct your life or certainly never a political uh, career or a campaign by polls and putting your finger in the wind. But, you know, really to know what your core values are and what you believe in, and then be able to present that to other people in a, in a friendly and thoughtful and cogent way. And to know that, you know, we can and we will disagree, but let's be agreeable when we do that. Unfortunately, so much of that is missing in Washington, D.C. And, you know, currently with what's going on down there, such, such divisiveness and I just like to encourage people across our great state to remember that we can disagree, but do it agreeably, that our enemy is not each other, and that we, we are blessed and fortunate to live in the greatest country on the face of the earth and to have the liberties and freedoms that we have, especially as women in, in the United States. We are really blessed to have um, the freedoms and liberties as people and as women to have the opportunities here is such a great thing. So I'm just thankful to God every day that I get up and re remember and know that um, how great it is to be an American and how great it is to live in Maryland. And that has been Kathy Slega, delegate of District 7, representing Baltimore and Hartford counties, minority whip in the Maryland House of Delegates, Republican nominee for the United States Senate in 2016, a member of the Health and Government Operations Committee, a former staffer for Congressman Amy Hatt, Andy Harris, and a current um, and uh, small business owner. Kathy speaks about uh, the importance in public service of, of having integrity and being true to oneself. She always talks, she talks about how public service has been a way in which she can remain true to her core values and also be respectful and agreeable um, when going against competition who have different perspectives and opinions in the public uh, limelight. She has worked through her candidacy to build the party organization and, has, and sees herself as a model for other women, for people similar to her who have many different types of backgrounds, but through public service, who are able to bring those backgrounds and the insights and experiences and, uh, uh, that, that are unique to those, the background that she brings uh, into public service in order to make uh, laws and government work better for all Marylanders. So, Kathy, I'd like to thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I just feel very fortunate to get this opportunity. And this has been Episode 127 of Public Interest Podcast with your host, Jordan Cooper, where we interview politicians, activists, advocates, and others who seek to improve the state of the world. Remember to, to subscribe to the podcast at publicinterestpodcast.com. Uh, 
go visit the podcast on iTunes or on podcast apps on Apple products. Feel free to leave a message for Kathy at 240-630-0380. I will convey that voicemail to her. And thank you so much for joining us. We will talk to you next time.